Hi, I'm Fabiola Sepulveda. And I'm Sharon Salani. And today we're going to be talking about tournament strategy. So what this lecture is going to cover is the local circuit, the national circuit, how to choose what tournaments to go to, and how to survive a tournament both literally and figuratively. The first thing we're going to talk about are local tournaments and what we refer to specifically for this lecture when we talk about local tournaments are smaller, more regional tournaments where teams usually don't travel to come to them and don't have TOC bids, which I'll get into in a little bit. So it's important to go to locals for a couple of reasons. And the first that it helps you develop in-round experience. And what this means is, first and foremost, it helps you become a better debater because you have more time to develop your skills and more rounds will always just make you better. And But in second, it'll help you test out arguments for a potentially bigger tournament you're going to later on that month. For example, if you have your NSDA qualifier in late February or early March and you have a smaller tournament at a high school the weekend before, you should go to that so you could test out what arguments you think will work over there, usually because the judging pool will be very similar. Which leads us into the second point as to why locals matter. It's because it helps you, it helps familiarize you with local teams and judges. And once you have an idea of what local teams or teams on your local circuit debate like and what the local judges want out of the round, it makes adapting a lot easier for you because it helps put you in a better position to win the round compared to someone who doesn't know what's happening on the local circuit. Um, knowing what your judges want and what other teams look like will help you prepare for your state qualifier, your NCFL, and your NSCA qualifier, which we'll also get to in a minute. And more importantly, these tournaments function as a way to fundraise for a lot of these schools. Um, so what tends to happen a lot of time is a lot of uh, smaller schools, primarily public schools, host local tournaments so they can fund their teams in terms of like giving them resources, coaching, and travel expenses and stuff like that. So by, by going to local tournaments, you're giving back to your community and your district so others can also travel and compete. Now we're going to talk about the national circuit. And when we talk about national circuit debate here in this lecture, we're mostly referring to tournaments with TOC bids, which is the Tournament of Champions. And so what is a TOC? Um, the TOC is a tournament held at the University of Kentucky every year. It's mostly on the last weekend of April, and it's considered to be the most prestigious regular season tournament of the year. Um, and what this means is, what the regular season means is that it's not during the summer like NCFL and NSC, but we'll get to that in a second. The TOC, in order to qualify to the TOC, you need to you need to receive two bids, meaning that the TOC uses a two bid system, which means that in order to qualify, you need to reach a certain round twice. For example, we give you the example in this PowerPoint where we talk about how reaching octafinals at the Glenbrooks tournament and quarterfinals at the Cypress Bay Tradition tournament will qualify you to the gold TOC. And what the gold TOC is is specifically what the it is what the TOC, it's the PF division of the TOC that's more prestigious. A couple of years ago, the Tournament of Champions Committee uh, announced the Silver TOC, which is essentially the same thing. It has the same, you need two bids. But there's a couple other ways you can get in. Um, in order to find out those ways, you can click on the link here in this PowerPoint and it'll take you there. But there's tournaments all around the country at different levels, at different where, where everyone could find their style of debate work best. So, so now we're going to talk about nationals. There are two nationals held by two different organizations. The first is the National Catholic Forensic League, or NCFL, and the latter one is the NSDA, or National Speech and Debate Association. So both of these tournaments have a national tournament that location changes every year and both of them use regional qualifiers. So what that means is that in your district there will be a tournament solely for the people in your district to qualify to said tournament. And 
as we said, that's why it's really important to go to locals so you know what's going on and can do better at these regional qualifiers. And these national tournaments tend to be very prestigious as people from across the country come, also increasing the difficulty as not only are there experienced debaters there, but there are all types and styles of debate there. Both tournaments offer a variety of events, um, both in debate and speech, but something unique about PF is that rather than follow the month to month topic, they each provide their own topic for PF. So now we're gonna be talking about how to choose which tournaments to go to. And there is no one answer because it frankly depends on a couple of things. First is what your goals are. So if your goal is solely to qualify to the TOC, then go to more tournaments that are national tournaments rather than locals. But if your goal is more to gain experience, then a combination may be best for you so that you not only build your skills up on a lay level, but also a more technical level. And then the second is what can you afford? So when you're thinking about paying for tournaments not to go to, you have to take into account tournament fees, travel expenditures, whether you're going by bus or by plane, and the money spent in the area. So for example, if you're a team that lives in the rural area of the West Coast, it would probably be more cost efficient for you to go to a tournament like Berkeley, which is in California, rather than a tournament like Harvard, which is in Boston, all ac across the other country, and which has a higher cost of living. And then the third thing is what the tournament is like. So think about the judging. Is it more technical or is it more lay? How is the organization run? So how many, how long is it? How many rounds do they have? When is bid? And then the third thing is the difficulty. And so what we mean by difficulty isn't that there's easier tournaments than others, but rather where do the experienced debaters go? Yeah, so there's never going to be an easy bid. Um, every bid is going to be really hard to get. Um, like Fabi was saying, it just depends on, like, for example, a lot of the time there's a lot of bid tournaments on the same weekend where some teams where a lot of the teams that are more experienced and older go to one side of the country while the other ones stay in like some other region. So, surviving debate. Please pause this, go drink some water. So, three things to literally survive a weekend of debate. And the first thing is to eat. And when we say eat, we mean real food. Not just the chips the tournament gave you or that you got from the vending machine. It's really important to eat real food, even if it is fast food, because not only is it necessary to keep you alive, but it'll also just have you in a better mood and allow you to be more focused on doing well. Then the second thing is to drink water, not just coffee. Oftentimes we forget that we are speaking for around eight hours a day. It's really important to have water, not only so we don't get sick later, but so that we can keep performing at our best. And if you're drinking coffee, make sure you're not overdoing it. So if you're someone that normally doesn't drink coffee, don't drink three cups of coffee at a tournament solely because you're staying up early or staying up really late. Just get more sleep. Then the third thing is to communicate, and that happens on three levels. First is the partner level if you have one. So if you're in policy or PF, it's really important to communicate with your partner, not only before the tournament, but during the tournament on what your goals are, how you're going to reach them, and what do you have to do after every round. But outside of the debate world, it's also just important to Ask them how they're doing. See if they're having a good time because you're going to be spending a lot of time with your partner if you're debating with them. And it's really important that you're on good terms. Then on the second level is your team. So this doesn't apply to everyone because not everyone travels with other people. But if you do travel as a team, even if they're not in your event, make sure you're checking up on them. Because let's say you're a debater doing PF and you have someone on your team in finals of oratory. 
it's really important to check up on them, not only to show that you're supporting them, but also just to make them feel included and so that everyone can have a better time. And then the third thing is check up on your chaperones. Make their lives easier by helping coordinate where your guys are going to eat, making sure no one gets lost. And this is really important, so for two reasons. One, you need chaperones for probably every trip you do, so it's really important to show that you appreciate them and make their life easier. But second is they're giving up their weekend to be here for you. It's important to show that you're appreciative and give back to them. So now between rounds of tournaments, there's a couple different things you can do to make the weekend easier and better, and this is in no means by order of importance. So the first thing is to make friends, whether this be with your opponents or the kids you're waiting for, the kids that are in front of you waiting for lunch, or the people that are outside of your room while you wait for your round. There's so many people at debate tournaments that you are guaranteed to find someone that you can be friends with. Even if you are a novice, don't feel don't feel uh, discouraged about making friends because at one point or another, everyone else was a novice. And if you're a varsity member who's had a lot of experience on the circuit and travels frequently, make sure that you're being open to making new friends and new experiences because not everyone feels confident enough to make those friends, but showing them a friendly face can help them have a better time and make them feel more confident to make friends. And then second thing is relax. Oftentimes debaters forget that we are more than our numerical score or how we do at a tournament. So it's okay to not break at every tournament, to not win every tournament. One tournament isn't going to define you. And if you're worried that it looks bad on your resume, it's okay to have to not always do well. That's how you learn what you need to improve on. And when you're relaxing, it allows you to not only feel less stressed, but it also makes debate fun. And at the end of the day, it's important to keep doing debate as long as it's fun for you. It shouldn't become a chore because you are actively choosing to spend your a lot of your weekends and you're choosing to spend a lot of money. So this should be as fun for as fun as possible for you. And then the last thing, which is more like debate focus, is to do redos. So give two redos for every speech you gave. And the reason it's important to give redos is twofold. First, it helps you analyze what you could have done better in that round so that next time you don't make similar mistakes. And then second, it helps you and your partner coordinate what you're going to do in the next rounds at that tournament. It's always important to take the tournament round by round rather than focus on a rather than focus on like the macro level focusing on round by round helps you keep focused on what you're doing and not get discouraged. So now we're going to talk about how to balance life and debate and um what's really important to remember is that you are in control of what you want out of both. Uh, I think personally that uh, it's important to make sure that you're staying in school and keeping up with your grades because at the end of the day, debate's an extracurricular activity you're doing for school. And if your goal is to get into college or pursue a higher education, like winning a tournament means nothing when you have like straight like these. Um, but if balancing school and debate does get a little hard, it's important for you to talk to your teachers and coaches. And what I mean by this is that I know a lot of teachers are, most teachers will be supportive of debate, but it's important that you're communicating with them when you are traveling or when you are missing school so that they know what your situation is. And usually what will happen is they will do their best to accommodate and they'll help, they'll do their best to help you out. Um, more importantly, taking a break is okay. And what I mean by this is that when you feel like debate is becoming a burden on you and, or it's just not becoming fun anymore, taking a break from it is very okay. I know a lot of seniors um, at the in their first semester of senior year 
they'll take the semester off so they can finish their college apps and do last minute like standardized testing and stuff like that. So taking a break is okay. I personally took one in the second half of my or the first half of my junior year because it just stopped being fun. And when I came back, I came back better. It was more fun. Taking a break is more than okay because at the end of the day, just do what is best for you like emotionally, I guess, and for your grades. You control what you want to debate. If you take a break, no one is going to get mad at you. And on that note, um, I think that is all we have today. Um, yeah, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for watching. If you have any questions on how to pick tournaments or something like that, feel free to message us in the Beyond Resolve Slack, or you can Facebook message Fabiola or I, I on Facebook. Have a good one.